Pints with Jack, Season 4, Episode 92. Bonus episode, Collecting Clive, Book Shopping with Andrew, Stephen, and Gordon. Well, welcome, everybody. Pints with Jack is your weekly C.S. Lewis podcast, where David, Matt, and I break down and discuss the works of C.S. Lewis. This year, we've gone through every letter of screw tape. We've discussed the silver chair, and we're having great fun wrapping up the season with some bonus episodes. And today, I want to talk about a deep passion of mine, talking or uh, shopping for C.S. Lewis books. And so I brought in two of the people I know uh, who do better at that than even I do. So uh, if you listen to the entire episode, at the end, I'm going to explain uh, what you have to do to win my services. I'm offering a free book concierge service where I'll help you track down a collectible C.S. Lewis book for a few of our listeners or supporters. So happy to be joined today on this episode by two of my good friends, uh, Dr. Stephen Beebe and Gordon Greenhill. Dr. Beebe was Regents and University Distinguished Professor of Communication Studies at Texas State San Marcos. He served as chair of the Department of Communication Studies for 28 years and as Associate Dean of the College of Fine Arts and Communication for 25 years. Stephen has been visiting scholar at both Oxford and Cambridge University. He also discovered a C.S. Lewis manuscript, which was part of an opening chapter of a book that was to be co-authored with J.R.R. Tolkien called Language and Human Nature. And oh, we wish that that book had been completed. <laughs> Stephen Beebe has visited our show, of course, before, um, and we loved having him on to talk about his new book, C.S. Lewis and the Craft of Communication, which I heartily recommend. And he also explained some of the communication secrets of our favorite devil, Screwtape. Our other guest uh, goes by Gordon Greenhill. Dr. Jeremy Gordon Grinnell, who goes by Gordon Greenhill professionally, has been scouring libraries, used bookstores, and internet collection publication data on C.S. Lewis's books. While an exhaustive history of his editions is probably impossible, this catalog contains the most extensive collection uh, online in hopes that fellow Lewis devotees will be able to review and expand its offerings from their own collections. It's kind of like how the OED got compiled, sure. gets compiled, yep. isn't it? So, and uh, Stephen and I, I think if I can speak for you, friend, I uh, have found that an invaluable resource Good. of different editions. So Stephen and Gordon, welcome to Pints with Jack. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Excellent. Well, we're going to do our standard episode segments um, and then dig into today's subject. We're going to start with uh, a quote of the week. And when it comes to Lewis and books, um, he said, I, yeah, I find when one has read a book that there's nothing so nice as discussing it with somebody else who's read it, even though it tends to produce rather fierce arguments. And so in light of that, I have two quotes of the week, one for each of our guests. So Steve, if you'd be willing to go ahead. I quite agree with what you say about buying books and love all the planning and scheming beforehand. And if they come by post, finding the neat little parcel waiting for you on the hall table and rushing upstairs to open it in the privacy of your own room. It is lovely in books in the way you can turn from one sort of beauty to another and never get tired. Ah, oh, fantastic. I think that's a letter to Arthur uh, during his, his Bookham days. Thank you. And Gordon? Arthur taught me to love the bodies of books. I had always respected them, but Arthur did not merely respect, he was enamored. And soon, I too. The setup of the page, the feel and smell of the paper, the differing sounds that different papers make as you turn the leaves became sensuous delights. Hmm. And that's from Surprised by Joy with that famous passage of uh, 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 where Lewis claims of his boyhood home, I had as much chance of finding a book that was new to me as a man walking into a field of grass, uh, man walking into a field has of finding a new blade of grass. So here's to books. So, well, and I think that we should cheers to books. Um, the drink of the week, again, I'm recording in the morning. Um, I'm recording this the day after I recorded the Max McLean podcast, which will air a week from today on August 30. Um, this episode is, of course, coming out on August 24th. Um, so because it's early in the morning, I thought it was a little too early for vintage scotch. And so I have a Starbucks Cafe Verona. What about you guys? 
I have Starbucks Christmas blend. Oh. Because when I go book hunting and I find something, it's like Christmas morning. When I find a book. So I thought Christmas blend, uh, which I drink all uh, all year long, by the way, but today especially, uh, I thought it was appropriate to enjoy Christmas blend. Oh, fantastic. And what about you, Gordon? I'm drinking a local blend called the Parkhouse Blend from a local roaster, um, mm. which is kind of my go-to. And just to, to try to fit in a little bit, I did add a splash of Irish cream. Uh, just to, there, you know, it seemed appropriate, even though the sun is just rising over here. Absolutely. Well, and Steve and I had a little adventure. Um, Steve, uh, uh, let's see. I don't want to divulge anything. Um, <laughs> at Steve's advice, uh, I once brought over to England um, some coffee from uh, HEB in, San An in, in Texas, the San Antonio blend, because a friend of Walter Hooper's, uh, Lewis's secretary of blessed memory, uh, a dear friend of his loved that blend. And so I brought over and left some coffee, but never got to meet Priscilla Tolkien, uh, oh. who's a big fan of Texas coffee. So I thank Steve for that advice. Well, let's jump in. Um, I gave some background information earlier, but would each of you mind sharing a little bit more about your background, particularly how you got into reading Lewis, and then we'll move on to a question about collecting. So I'd love to hear from, from both of you. Gordon, if you'd be willing to start. Sure. Well, as far as reading Lewis, uh, I appropriated uh, uh, the Narnia at my mother's knee growing up. She read them to me, but that was really all I knew of Lewis until college when I discovered the Space Trilogy, and then things went sort of downhill quickly from there. Um, although it did take four or five attempts, as is not uncommon, to make it through that hideous strength before I found the magic. Yeah, And now it's I think it's probably one of my favorites. But then I went on and eventually did my wrote my dissertation on Lewis and uh, his understanding of the early Genesis material, you know, myth and myth and Charlie Starr was his actually dissertation was invaluable for me back in back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was kind of how I fell into C.S. Lewis. But while I was doing th that, I discovered that trying to discover what edition any other scholar was citing mm -hmm. as far as pagination is an absolute nightmare because there is no sort of authorized editions of Lewis for, for this academic community to sort of all have in common other than maybe first editions, if you have them. And that's where the disordered image, the website kind of got its birth. I began sort of cataloging and kind of making notes about the differences uh, when someone would quote screw tape this edition and I'd have to go figure out what page that was in the edition I had. Um, that's where it began. And so I began discovering that uh, different editions, there were ones that looked alike and ones that didn't. And I just began making records. And um, over the course of a decade, it somehow found its way to the interweb. <laughs> and that's where it came from. Well, and uh, we're glad that it did. Um, we'll, of course, publish the link to your to your site, but mention again for us it, um, where we can where we can find you. It's C.S. Lewis Editions, all one word, just like that. C.S. Lewis Editions dot com. Great. Or okay. if you just Google the disordered image, it'll come up as well. Which, of course, is a word play on discarded image. Absolutely. Well, and I love you're talking about um, the the trouble with that hideous strength and uh, listeners in a week and a half or so, Diana Glyer's new book, uh, Compass for Deep Heaven, mm. uh, essays on the space, uh, the, the ransom books. Um, we did an interview with her and with a couple of the contributors, and there's a lot of good help in there if you too have, have struggled with that hideous strength. Steve, what about you reading Lewis? Is that something you grew up with? You know, it wasn't. I didn't discover Lewis until I was in my mid-40s, actually. And it came about through visiting Oxford. Sort of mm -hmm. serendipitously on a bus trip, we stopped in Oxford, and I discovered in that one-hour visit that I loved Oxford, and I needed mm -hmm. to find a way to come back. And I did. I this developed a, a proposal for a sabbatical and spent a, a, a term in Oxford. And while there, I said, I think... Uh, you know, I've heard of Lewis, certainly one of, one of the most quoted individuals in sermons and, and uh, presentations. I thought, I think, I think Lewis lived here. I should know something about it. <laughs> and uh, a new biography by A.N. Wilson that um, many people comment about, but for me, it was my introduction to Lewis. And I read the book, and I was just fascinated by C.S. Lewis, the person. Mm -hmm. And so it was even a year or so later, I really said, well, let me start reading some of Lewis. And that's really how I got hooked. My, my family and I are in the crowd scene 
in the movie Shadowlands. Oh. And I remember coming back to the States and watching the movie when it came out. And there were references to The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. But I didn't get those references hmm. because I hadn't yet read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. So I, oh. I did. And that, the rest, as they say, is history. I just, Lewis spoke to me with a clarity and an insight and an imagination. Uh, and in my own research as a communication professor, I was interested in what Lewis said about communication because I found he had a lot to say about that. So my own uh, twist on Lewis was to explore how did he do that? Hmm. How, why are we having this conversation yet today about this person? What did he know about how to connect with people and how to change people's lives with just symbols, with just words. Mm. So that was my study. And, and uh, my book, C.S. Lewis and the Craft of Communication, uh, shares my travels with C.S. Lewis along those lines. Oh, well, and it's, I can attest, it's a marvelous book. I've been talking with, with you about it since its progress. And we'll, of course, have a link to that. And you elucidate five keys that made Lewis a great communicator. But I found those keys to be really adaptable to, to lots of different places. So uh, I, I'm grateful for those. So before we talk about book shopping, um, we're talking about shopping for Lewis books, collecting Lewis books, something that we all do uh, devotedly. How did you get into collecting different editions? Um, Gordon's given us a little bit of his. I'd love to hear from yours, uh, about yours, Steve. Well, after I started reading Lewis, and uh, we would spend uh, uh, weeks and sometimes months in Oxford because we just loved it. I remember going, and if you've been to Oxford, you've probably been to the Oxfam bookshop, mm -hmm. not far from the Eagle and Child. And, I, and they sometimes would feature special books. And one day I walked in there and there were just, uh, I think it was um, broadcast talks, mm -hmm. maybe transposition and other addresses. And they were first editions. Mm -hmm. And I just said, oh my gosh, that would be so wonderful. This person that began to change my own life, to connect with him by having books that would have looked the same as if when he held them in his hand. Yes. We're all <laughs> nodding. We're doing this on Zoom and we're all nodding vigorously. <laughs> the first of these, so so both my first books were little the, the little paperback pamphlets that I bought of Lewis in the Oxfam bookshop in Oxford. And um, these quotes from Lewis and about what it's like to hold them in your hand and uh, having your heart beat just a little faster mm -hmm. because there was a connection, uh, an implicit one, uh, a material one mm -hmm. with C.S. Lewis. And so from that was about uh, uh, 2000, 2001. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've been on my collecting journey uh, only a couple of decades, but I've tried to make up for lost time in that process. So uh but, but I continue to find um, just a pleasure in connecting with C.S. Lewis. And then I also use them in my talks as I give lectures and talks about Lewis. Mm -hmm. I find that's a way to share that connection with Lewis with others through artifacts. Tell that story, if you would, about Surprised by Joy and walking the wrong way out of Oxford the first time he was there. Would you tell that quickly? Yes, he writes about it, Surprised by Joy, about leaving the train station and, uh, and and so I think he left on the wrong platform. If you come into Oxford, he would have left on platform two instead of platform one. And so he would have turned around and started walking. But then he realized that he was seeing what he called mean shops and small uh, community, not the spires of Oxford. And then uh, that's when he said he turned around and there before him were the spires of Oxford. Nothing ever quite so beautiful. And he mm -hmm. describes how that was an allegory for his life, mm -hmm. how uh, realizing he was going the wrong way, turning around and then seeing the beauty. I think that's a wonderful uh, transpositional metaphor, really, of mm -hmm. Lewis, how he, in that example, uh, captures uh, an emotion, a sensation uh, about Oxford. And uh, I could identify with that because I had a similar experience. <laughs> it sounds almost like the gray town, right? The shabby little uh, town of our expectations. Uh, my reading of Lewis began, um, I may have mentioned here before, uh, as a, a, a boy, uh, had an aunt who sent me copies of the Chronicles. And I was we we're not in a believing family at all, but I was enchanted by, uh, by all things Narnia. 
And um, then when I became a Christian in high school and reread the Chronicles, I was uh, very proud of myself to have discovered elements of Christianity in the Chronicles <laughs> of Narnia. I know that will surprise many, so we can pause for a moment. <laughs> my wife, of course, has written a best-selling book about that. Um, but it wasn't until my 20s where I was living in Nashville, Tennessee and working in the Christian music business um, that I really began to dig into uh, Lewis. I had gotten to know Phil Keggy, the guitar player, and we'll be doing an episode with Phil uh, up uh, here pretty soon. I was at a time where my faith was really beginning to flag and Lewis, uh, Phil lent me letters to an American lady. And I think quickly I moved on to Surprise by Joy. And that really kind of absolutely solidified my faith and at least the intellectual engagement in it. And it was also through Lewis that I got to know um, folks in the band Over the Rhine um, from Cincinnati, Ohio. Their first album was called Till We Have Faces. And on their second album, there's a song called Jaxi about Joy Davidman coming back as a ghost to visit C.S. Lewis. And so I got to know them, did some work with them. My first, first edition uh, an American first edition of uh, Till We Have Faces was a gift from Over the Rhine. And then I also uh, hung out with um, a band called Chagall Guevara. And Wade Janes was the bass player in that band featuring Steve Taylor, for those of you old enough to know. And Wade gave me one of those red screw tape letters with the, with the drawing on the back. And uh, I think that was actually my first collectible Lewis, and I was off and running. It was hard with um, with Over the Rhine because they were all Lewis collectors, so we'd travel and we'd go into bookshops, and we'd all head for the same sections, and so the competition was fierce. Well, talking about bookstores, um, I want to talk about um, resources. So we want this episode to be helpful for those who are thinking about, you know, adding to their Lewis collection uh, or intrigued with that. What are some of, and I have a few listed here, but what are some of the book or print resources that you have found really helpful in developing your collections? I had uh, the great privilege to become a friend with Ed Brown as I was beginning my collection. And uh, I, I really didn't know much about the value or worth of books, but I found uh, a, a website that, that Webb had and, uh, or that, that Ed had and uh, had the privilege of visiting with him in his home a couple of times and found just his uh, generosity. And even though uh, Ed has passed away, he's left us a great legacy in his book, the Pursuit of C.S. Lewis, in which he describes his own journey, uh, much like this podcast. If he were here, he would uh, join in and talk about his experiences. Uh, so that's one I highly recommend. Uh, and it too, like like Gordon's website, it it includes covers of first editions, and uh, but it provides some great insight and advice. So that's one I'd recommend. Absolutely. I'd certainly second that. And Gordon, I want to hear your thoughts about that. That I would get the, the, the paperback, the second printing of that book. And it has an insert with, as Steve mentioned, color pictures of all the covers. And uh, it was also produced by Dan Hamilton, who's still alive. And actually just a couple of weeks ago, as we record, uh, did a, a session for the Inkling Folk Fellowship run by Joe Martin Rickey on Facebook. And so he talked about Lewis collecting so, um, Gordon, what about you and print resources? Well, obviously, Hooper's companion is uh, was invaluable for me, building the website and then also collecting as well, simply because it provides so much of the early data. Now, of course, it's dated now. Um, if you're looking for the you know the early editions, first editions, American, British, that kind of thing, it's it's uh, it's got all the information there. But of course, um, anything post I was at ninety two or when, whenever that uh, whenever that you know, sunsets. Um, if you're a collector of more recent editions, then it won't help you. But um, yeah, I found it uh, wonderful for organizing the the material, particularly the early stuff. Absolutely. Well, and then Jim Como um, did, was it, uh, what's the latest edition of uh, Lewis at the Breakfast Table? Is that We Remember C.S. Lewis or let's, oh yes, I'm sorry. So remembering C.S. Lewis, as you mentioned, Gordon, and we want to give folks, um, and we'll, we'll certainly have a list of links in the show notes 
want to give folks kind of some direction. So um, In Pursuit of C.S. Lewis by Ed Brown, the C.S. Lewis Companion and Guide by Walter Hooper, you can usually find that on Amazon for, for not much and often on eBay. The Companion and Guide has an 80-page bibliography. And that bibliography was updated by James Como. Jim Como was the founder of the New York C.S. Lewis Society, and he has done a number of editions of remembering C.S. Lewis. It started out as Lewis at the Breakfast Table. And in the most recent, which is available for 20 bucks on Amazon, um, there's an updated list by Walter. But as you said, Gordon, it doesn't have some of the latest editions. Any other print things that help you all out? I am I'm at, well. I'm actually looking at my site right now, and though I don't remember, um, I don't have any memories of, of using it. I actually listed uh, Joe Christopher's and uh, Joan Ostling's C.S. Lewis: The Annotated Checklist. Yes, I mean it's a 1976, so again dated, but uh, um, it's something I used early on in the process. There are actually two volumes. I'm not sure Joe Christopher did both of them, but there are two volumes of Lewis bibliography, and also helpful. I found great help in the C.S. Lewis Reader's Encyclopedia. West and, oh, I forget. Well, we'll have it listed. And they give some publication details about every essay, every book, and oftentimes some pictures. So those have been helpful. Um, Steve, you mentioned the Taylor Collection um, briefly. Tell us a little bit more. I've never had a chance to visit that collection. Ed uh, gave his books to Taylor University. So it's the result of his collection, his first edition. And I've not been there either, but I know from my visits with Ed, uh, that I think he had every, uh, I think he was a completist, um, as they say in the book trade, people who want to find every uh, first edition that someone published. But some wonderful uh, letters as well as uh, ephemera from uh, and about C.S. Lewis. Uh, but I know it's an excellent, excellent collection. Um, there's also, I think it's the uh, Lanier Collection in Houston yes. that has a uh, collection of Lewis. Uh, that's uh, worth noting. And then um, it was uh, uh, Walter Hooper who donated some of his letters uh, to and from Lewis. Uh, is that North Carolina? Uh, yes. Um, he gave he not only, not only letters, but also a lot of Lewis's scholarly books are at UNC Chapel Hill. And you can search that catalog. They they note which are annotated. And I had plans to visit there until the pandemic um, broke out. And so UNC has a collection. And then the Western manuscripts um, at, at the Bodleian, Steve? Yes, the Bodleian Library, if you can uh, journey to Oxford, uh, it is just a wonderful treasure trove. One of my favorite things to do in the world is to sit in the, the reading room and just surround myself with Lewis manuscripts to, to look at his writing. There are letters, there are manuscripts, there are fair copies of manuscripts. So in terms of manuscripts, it's probably, uh, I know that the, the Wade Center that we haven't yet talked about, but I'm sure we will, they have a, an exchange agreement. Um, in fact, I remember one time Walter handed me a packet. He knew I was leaving Oxford to head to uh, Chicago. And he said, um, Steve, would you take this copy? It was some notes of Lewis's lectures. He said, would you deliver this photocopy to the Wade Center? So I had a chance to do that from, from Walter to the Wade Center. So I know they have that agreement. But the, the, the Bodleian Library uh, reading room and the librarians are so helpful there. Uh, is just an, uh, one of my favorite places to be in the world. Mm, fantastic. Uh, Gordon, have you been to the Wade Center? Uh, actually, yes. The Wade was, um, and Laura Schmidt specifically, the, the chief archivist You're there. You're here. Yes, right. To Laura, um, everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cheers. That was really the genesis of the website because I needed to build a skeleton for it. And I didn't even know what I didn't know mm -hmm. about the additions. And they had a sufficient uh, sampling that I could go in and compare. And they actually gave me some really, they actually let me sit in the basement in the Holy of Holies wow. uh, with my scanner, you know, my little page scanner, wow. like uh, scanning copyright pages so I could actually reproduce all the material on the website when I got home. And so, yeah, I was there probably oh, 15, 20 times for just working through building the, the, the skeletal structure for the website for the Wade. So they were, yeah, I have not been able to get to Taylor either. I was on the it was on my schedule to do when COVID hit, 
And uh, I imagine they're going to be able to fill some holes for me as well on the website. Certainly. I, you know, I got a photocopy from there um, of Joy Davidman's copy of Mere Christianity. Oh, which wow. uh, shakes up some things in the timeline of their meeting. And that's about all I'll say. Um, yeah, I haven't <laughs> been to Taylor uh, either. Uh, I have great hopes to be invited by them to come and speak at some point. Um, they do the C.S. Lewis and Friends Symposium uh, every two years, I believe. And so I hope to uh, I hope to get an invite from them and would love to love to go. And yes, I, I second the Wade Center. There's such a treasure trove, not only of Lewis, but also Tolkien, George MacDonald, Charles Williams, Owen Barfield, Dorothy Sayers, and G.K. Chesterton. But they have uh, 2,500 volumes of Lewis's own library there at the Wade. And yes, um, foreign translations, just about everything you can imagine. Um, so often when I find something that I think is rare, I'll shoot a note to the marvelous archivist, Laura Schmidt, and, uh, and say, hey, do you have this? And often as not, they, they certainly do. Um, and I also, as we speak, today's uh, late July, just got some emails this week from Charlie Starr, who is at the Wade this week, and they are back open and receiving scholars uh, on a limited basis. So the Wade is open, and you can find out more by, by contacting them. I was reading this past week that uh, Clyde Kilby, who founded the Wade Center, started it with 15 letters of his own and a few books that he had. So to those C.S. Lewis collectors listening to this, um, you never know when your collection may become important and, and may develop into something that others want to read and touch and see. But it started quite modestly and has now become the premier research center in the world for C.S. Lewis and others. Absolutely. Well, and this, uh, a lot of times when I talk about Lewis at conferences, people apologize for not knowing as much Lewis. And I say we are all amateurs in that marvelous French sense of the word that we love this person and what he has done for us. So these kind of acts of, of material devotion are acts of love for somebody who has influenced our lives. And I think that that's a, and, and so collecting um, is a way of expressing that and, and, and sometimes can actually help the community. Uh, I was given by a former student of Lewis's a copy of a book from Lewis's own library, um, uh, by uh, an early English text society book of the works of the poet Hockleave, um, who is a friend of Chaucer's. And Lewis's former student, a few years before he passed, sent me this book, and it was signed by Lewis with all kinds of notes and, a, and an annotated, you know, a, 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 an index in the back. Um, and I have left that at the Wade Center because I want scholars to, to have access to that. So yeah, I think starting, starting small, and letters turn up often. Um, so people discover a letter by Lewis tucked into some old books. So speaking of let's how to get a hold of books, um, let's talk about some general tips about how to collect books. And one of the things that I really like to say is that if you're looking for C.S. Lewis books, they are going to take you all around a bookstore. What sections would you go to in a bookstore in order to find C.S. Lewis books? Well, I, yeah, and there's a difficulty because he wrote in so many genres that you can't just go to the Lewis section, you know, like you can uh, for some authors go to the one section they are, but you're you're going to find him in juvenile literature mm -hmm. uh, or young, even young adult literature. You will ha perhaps find him in uh, fantasy sci-fi. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll find him in letters. Mm -hmm. You will find him in um, apologetics and philosophy. Sure. Obviously, you will find him in religion. Sure. Uh, so you, yeah, you really almost need a guided tour of every bookstore to make sure you're not missing anything. Where else, Steve? Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I think that's what makes collecting Lewis so much fun mm -hmm. is it does take you to the far corners of a bookstore. And I think, uh, Gordon, I think you've hit the, hit the high points there as you think about theology and philosophy and literature and poetry and children's, uh, literature, uh, but that adds to the excitement of the hunt. When you walk into a bookstore, your heart beats just a little faster as you wonder, is there something here? And then you begin to scan the shelves to see what might be there. Many shelves in many different places. I think that that's absolutely true. Um, fiction, I don't think we mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. Classics, uh, uh, literary criticism. 
Um, did we mention biography? Um, so it just, and once you, once you go into a bookstore looking for Lewis, it kind of tells you what kind of shape that bookstore is. I think a number of years ago, I'm not sure if they have been updated, but there used to be these guides to, they were called the book lovers guides and they were split up, I think in seven different regions of the United States, the book lovers guide to, you know, the Pacific Northwest. And they would list every bookstore in every town and tell you whether or not they were worth going to. Now, this was back in the 90s, early 2000s, and I'm not sure if they're still going, but uh, those were certainly helpful. So um, what else has helped you? Oh, what are some of your favorite bookstores where you have uh, found some great things? I love Blackwell's Rare Books in Oxford. And there are several uh, bookstores in Cambridge that I've had some wonderful experiences. And 20 years ago, there were a number of rare and used bookstores in Oxford. And that's really where I got my start, uh, was just simply going to bookstores in Oxford looking for Lewis British first editions. That's really, and that's what I've continued to focus on. I have some American firsts, mm -hmm. um, but it's British firsts that I found in Oxford bookstores. Blackwell's mm -hmm. is one that's still there today. That, that is a, a good source to continue to peruse. Yeah, Blackwell's has got some marvelous things. Um, I love it though. Uh, oftentimes you'll find Lewis and Tolkien books under the section local interest there yeah. in Oxford. So what about in the States? Are there any bookstores that you, uh, that you have found and loved? Um, one of my favorites is uh, Powell's in Portland, um, which is a city block and they have a strong online presence. Um, I don't know if any of you all have been to Moe's uh, bookstore in Berkeley. But it's also, I think, four levels, um, and they're still open. And then on our way home from Florida, we made, we were planning on stopping by the Book Mine in Jacksonville, Florida, which is another huge rambling uh, uh, bookshop with hundreds and thousands of books. So um, other favorites, other places that you've had some success? Well, my favorite, it's actually on the other end of the spectrum. My favorite is almost the the small, unheard of little mom and pop store stuck in the back corner of a, of a shopping mall or something to that yes. effect, because they are, and this is, I don't know how this will come off when, it, when I say it out loud, but they often don't know the value of what they have yes. because they're just ex opening boxes of things that are just there. And I've often found some really nice little treats, usually nothing, you know, extremely extravagant, but you can find some really unexpected things, you know, for a few dollars, because for them, they're just unloading paperbacks left and right, and they don't really care what the value is or who the author is. Mm. So for me, no bookstore when you're collecting is too small. Yeah, no, I think that that's true. And that's part of why I have on my list here too, thrift stores. Um, sometimes you can grab something that's, that's nice. I've found a number of nice things um, collecting Lewis and also Heim Potok and other authors at half price books. And sometimes yes. they have in their collectible sections, they'll have uh, nice things, but sometimes just out on the shelves. Um, when you talk about little mom and pop book sh bookshops, um, I keep hoping to find Clive Hamilton uh, in a little bookshop for $2.50. Uh, That's right. Yes. Of course, Lewis's pseudonym for some of his early work. Um, and yeah, when they don't know what they have, that's a, a great thing. What about online? What are some of the resources that you have found there? I use a ABE Books it is a good source. Plus, if there's something I want, I just put the book into the search engine and say first edition and see what comes up. <laughs> uh, sometimes what you find are books that, that are no longer there, that particular sort of catch-all. You, you find books that have been for sale rather than are for sale. Um, and while I enjoy that, and while I enjoy having that, there's nothing quite like the non-virtual experience of finding the book yourself. Yes. The internet does make it easy to, to acquire what we want. I still love the hunt and love the thrill of stumbling across the book and touching it and, and smelling it and putting it in my hand. So, uh, so, but I do use online searches as well. And my, my experience, and it's a caution, I suppose, with many online sellers, particularly e, uh, ABE, which I use a lot as well, is that a lot of times larger uh, bookstores are just dumping their entire stock you know, into those search engines, and they're not really careful about the details. So if you're looking for a first edition or something that's very specific, um, 
you, you may find it as such, but if you're looking as I do often for like a little slushy paperback mm-hmm. version, there's really no guarantee that what they're representing in the cover photo or anything like that is actually the thing you're going to get. I can't tell you how many copies of Till We Have Faces paperbacks that I have picked up hoping to put my hands on the black and white Mariner cover only to have it be the, the colored Harcourt. And, I, and I'll contact him and say, this is, you said the Mariner, uh, it's just a default. We filled in the gaps. Yeah and dumped it all in there and it's just an algorithm. And so when you're shopping online, you've if, if you're gonna dump money into it, a lot of money, you wanna be extremely careful about that you're actually getting what you're looking for. If it's a $3 paperback that you're filling out a hole in your collection, maybe it's not a big deal, but it, you don't, yeah, the difference of actually holding it in your hand and knowing what you're getting in a bookstore versus shopping online can be a bit perilous. There's a caveat emptor involved. Absolutely. Well, and that's where um, the craft of communication helps uh, because I found that uh, emailing and asking for yeah. specific pictures is helpful. Um, a lot of the online places on eBay and elsewhere, uh, World of Books, things like that thrift books. Um, they don't have the capacity to show you exactly what there is. Famously, I've been trying to track down. Uh, I think I have every single published edition of Till We Have Faces, but there's one where the image is of a statue, a white statue looking away at a vine covered wall um, with brick on it. And um, I've seen that edition listed dozens and dozens of times. Um, but it, I don't think that it exists. And in talking to a, a bookseller friend um, uh, who used to work for Harper Collins, he said that that was uh, a projected cover, but perhaps not ever published. So I uh, haven't been able to find that. Uh, you talk about, Steve, um, putting your hands on it. I had this marvelous experience at Captain's Corner in Asheville, North Carolina, which is no longer there. And I was on the road with Phil Keggy. Uh, we had done a, a festival in Asheville. David Wilcox played that weekend. Um, and we were circling to find a parking spot for lunch. And I saw a bookshop and I said, hey, can I jump out real quick? And I dashed in and came away with three hardback first edition, I think some first printings of the, the Cosmic Trilogy, an American first edition of The Last Battle for $50 in a, in a dust jacket. And there was another first of Last Battle, uh, which I later put Jerry Root onto. And uh, I'm, he bought it, and then I probably gave it away. Um, but the one I left behind was a $75 first edition of uh, Essays Presented to Charles Williams, which now is worth, you know, I don't know, five or six times that. So uh, the, we'll talk a little bit more about the ones that got away. Also online, um, Stan Shelley. Uh, Shelley and Sons uh, has a wonderful collection and you can find him online. You can find him on eBay. You can sign up for his newsletter. And uh, it's kind of a, uh, a regatta amongst Lewis, uh, Lewis lovers that when he puts out his new newsletter, um, uh, a lot of us will scan through and, and grab the ones first. I think Steve probably has a, an inside track before that. Have any of you actually met Stan in person? I have. Yes. He's just the, uh... Uh, a delightful, delightful friend. And uh, we've had some good conversations. I met him at a conference and he's the kind of person that when you, when you met him, meet him, you say, uh, you have one of those you two kind of experiences uh, that uh-huh. uh, Lewis talks about. And so there is that, that bond, but I found him uh, just a delightful, uh, good friend mm. and would highly recommend his, his website. And if you ever have the chance and you're in uh, Asheville, North Carolina, to stop into his bookstore, it's kind of a treasure trove. Uh, I had the opportunity last year to do that and wow. kind of catalog the stuff he had there. And it's, it, it is, it's like wandering through a, boy, I don't know how, it feels like a kind of a church attic, mm. uh, you know, filled with boxes and boxes and boxes. And he, he collects more than Lewis. Um, so there's all kinds of interesting things around there, but I mean, his, the stuff he's got there with Lewis, even the stuff that doesn't appear in the catalog Mm -hmm. is actually pretty amazing as well. Ah, fantastic. I know that as we're recording, they just had the, uh, the Inklings weekend at Montreat college, uh, the fantastic Don W King and Hal Poe. Um, and I know that Stan was there and it, I lamented not being able to, to get there. There's also Rosalie books. Do you know Rosalie books in England, Steve? I do. I've had a chance to, to, to visit the shop in uh, the, the northern part of the Lake District and delightful day uh, uh, visiting. And yes, it's a very, again, uh, and, and I think these ones that we're mentioning, 
with them, you don't have to worry about what you're getting. They, right. they, they, they know, they understand what they have and the value of what they have. And, and they love books too. And they love putting books in the hands of people who also love books. So both Stan and Rosalie and even Blackwells and some of the ones that we've mentioned uh, understand the love and passion we have for these artifacts and how they connect us with the author. One of my great treats from Ian at Rosalie Books. I was staying for a few days in 2017 at the Kilns after a conference and bought uh, Transpositions first edition from Ian for seven pounds, uh, marvelously uh, affordable, and had him mail it to me at the Kilns. And so I have never opened the envelope. So I have a Lewis first edition addressed to me at the Kilns uh, from Ian, thanks to him. Um, you know, I also, uh, this is not a plug for my site, but this is kind of where, uh, where this has come from. And we've listed my site here on Pints with Jack before. I currently collect Lewis books. In fact, I'm sitting right next to uh, several first editions of the Screw Tape Letters. And I may not even list this until Christmas, but I have a set of first edition later printings of the British Narnias that I may list around Christmas time. Um, and so I do some selling on my on my eBay site and have been given permission from a lot of the social, social media groups to post there. And I also do kind of, I serve as a concierge. So if somebody's going to buy some high-end books, I'm happy to do a little Zoom tour of what's in my collection. So uh, occasionally do that. I'm getting ready to uh, to list a bunch of those. Um, and certainly will do so uh, in the fall and around Christmas. What do we look for in a first edition? Quality okay. and the, the the dust jacket, or, or as they say in the UK, the dust wrapper mm -hmm. is uh, a significant portion of the value of a book. Uh, so, and then you look for um, you know, foxing or spots, or is it in in good condition? So. Uh, but the dust dust wrapper or dust jacket is is I think key. Um, but sometimes if you just want to own a book, if you're beginning to collect, buying a first edition without the dust wrapper, uh, if you're not particularly interested in resale and you just want it for the emotional connection, that's a good way to begin to find something that's more reasonable but still has the words and has the the content that has moved you, and so you want to touch those words. I think that you're absolutely right. And sometimes the prices of those um, with dust jackets are exponentially higher as without. And, and so I think that's beautifully put. Book club editions, sometimes books will be listed as book club editions. And oftentimes those are a little bit lower quality. So it's worth paying attention to that. And some books, uh, Gordon, I'm sure you can talk about Letters to an American Lady, aren't there? Dozens of those different kinds. Well, we've not actually had the chance to catalog uh, Lewis's letters yet. That's okay. like the next phase. Now that the wait is open, we should see that coming online soon when I can get back over there. But uh, on book club editions, I will say this, that uh, we've worked pretty diligently at the disordered image to to try to identify some of those distinctive marks. Mm -hmm. You know, that this has a watermark here or something different about the, the dust jacket or the cover. So if you're, that might be another resource if you're struggling to know whether what you're looking at is a true first edition or a, a kind of a book club knockoff, um, that would be a place you could go to, you know, see if there are listed differences. And again, Stan Shelley has been an invaluable resource to us to help to distinguish those as well. What's the difference between a first edition and a first printing? I know that language gets a little fuzzy. Well, and exactly because that language is fuzzy, that's one of the reasons we've organized the site using the word setting uh, as opposed to edition, um, you know, kind of thinking more in terms of like the old typeface you know, the, the, the printer setting, mm -hmm. because we, we were interested in uh, which books, though the cover may change, which books are actually this identical inside the covers with the same pagination and the same printing so that you could tell if you were uh, citing the same book, even if it looks different. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I'm not exactly sure how edition is defined, but printing, of course, is the, the order in which it came off the press. Uh, they do, they print in batches, obviously. Mm -hmm. So they'll print 3,000 copies, and that's the first printing. And then they will print when that runs slow. They do another printing of the same thing. And usually on the uh, on the data page, the uh, publication data page, it will be listed, or often, in the older books that this was the seventh printing or the ninth printing. And of course, the value uh, may still be it may still be collectible, mm -hmm. but the the real high value is if it says first printing or is one of those first batch that came off. That's where the real money is. 
Yeah, Steve, do you have some insight too about that? That's where I think the, some of the books that we talked about earlier to help with your research, knowing when was this book first published, uh, mm -hmm. that will be helpful to you if you're interested in uh, a true first edition, first printing. Uh, and and that's what I'm most interested in, especially the the UK edition uh, are, is what I'm, I, I find exciting because that's what Lewis would have seen. That's what he would have. Uh, so that's, uh, again, my, my interest is a way of connecting with him through books that he would have seen. Boy, me too. And just as a shorthand to our listeners, as Gordon said, the first edition is how the look, book looked the first time it came out. Then they go through several printings. So I have right here, I'm showing up to the Zoom camera, a first edition, American first edition, of the screw tape letters. And then you can see on the, I'm showing the, the camera, you can see on the title page, it says uh, reprinted in March of 1943. So that's the second printing of how the first edition looked. And so um, for those kind of wanting to, to get into it with a limited budget, just to get even a 10th or a 12th printing uh, of the first edition is good enough to kind of see and smell and and feel what that book might have looked like. So, um, yeah, caulking is another uh, issue that you have with books. Sometimes they're a little bit tilted, and so that's also a thing to look for. Uh, oh, Lewis, I think played a game with us sometimes. Um, doesn't he publish under some pseudonyms? Is that worth uh, rummaging around bookstores for? Certainly, we mentioned uh, the Clive. Hamilton, uh, the Spirits in Bondage, and Dimer, which are among the most coveted, uh, in part because of that, also because uh, especially Spirits in Bondage didn't sell very well, and the publisher had some of the remainders destroyed, so there are not many copies available. But also, if you go into a bookstore and you're looking for Lewis, and you see a thin little book of of uh, poetry that that some find helpful and others find not very helpful, but you might pick it up and see Clive Hamilton and let it sit there on the shelf. Um, but you shouldn't do that. Um, so th that's that's also something to look for. I, uh, I did a tour, a Zoom tour with Gordon uh, uh, six months ago, where I showed him some things from my collection that he hadn't seen yet, and then took some pictures for him. Um, one of my favorite uh, kind of sets is all of the different first editions of A Grief Observed, because Lewis published it in the UK and the US under N.W. Clerk, which means not Wilk Clerk. Uh, N.W. was a it means not Wilk means I know not whom. And Lewis would often publish poems and other things under that pseudonym. And a clerk is a scholar. Uh, if you remember your Chaucer, there was a clerk of Oxenford. I think at the urging of T.S. Eliot, Lewis allowed them to change the name to his name so more people could be benefited by that book. But there's a British and American first of A Grief Observed under N.W. Clerk. Then there are British and American firsts under C.S. Lewis. But in the American, you can find, if you look carefully, a first edition, American first, that says C.S. Lewis on the dust jacket, but on the cloth, it still says clerk. So they had printed up more books than they had dust jackets. And so there are five different kind of first editions of that book, which is, is great fun. Speaking of that, uh, what, uh, what's your favorite find? What's the, what's the book that you are uh, ridiculously proud of or just something that you just uh, thrilled you to, to, to get? Gordon, what's one of your favorites? Well, I say I'm a different kind of collector than you, than you two insofar as I'm interested in sort of, I like the low end slushy reprints that are very, you know, they're, they're interesting and intriguing. I and, love that uh, word slushy. That's uh, fantastic. Yeah, it's what it, cause what it feels like. And they have almost no resale value whatsoever, but they're very interesting. Uh, for I'm holding up to the camera now this uh, this evergreen edition of the uh, the Narnia yeah. ad, which has this lovely Renaissancey sort of cover to it, to mm -hmm. very not Narnian art, uh, but and, and on the inside it's a very pedestrian, you know, nothing interesting about it, but it's just such an interesting collection. And the ABC Cleo Windrush produced a large print oh. volume set of the the Narnia that are actually really quite hard to find. I've only got four of them. But they're wonderful for reading to kids because of the print, the large, you know, print. Mm -hmm. And uh, whenever I find these, I, you know, I love to pick them up. So I, 
and I'm always I'm always most fascinated, and the, and it still happens that I'll find a, a a paperback, a little thin paperback version of the Screw Tape Letters that I didn't know existed before. In fact, I think you put one, yeah, put me onto one in that in that Zoom tour that I have subsequently picked up my own copy of. Um, those are my favorite finds. Uh, once and you know, collectors usually aren't interested in those, so you find them very, very cheaply. Uh, but they get, uh, they, I don't know, they just bring me joy to see like the diversity of how many editions the screw tape letters went through, how many different kinds of covers. I think it's up to 42 I've identified now. Wow, wow, of, uh, 42 and, editions of screw tape, uh, but actually only what 12 or 15 settings, right? So it's they just continue to repurpose the covers, even though the book itself is the same on the inside. So it's just, it's a lovely, yeah, I love that kind of minutia about it. It's a bit neurotic. <laughs> well, it's a neurosis we all share. And I love what you said about the slushy ones, the little green edition of um, dark green edition of Letters to an American Lady was the book that Phil lent me. And I recently picked that up for two ninety nine or something, but it has an emotional connection. Or the old Avon covers of, yes. uh, of the Ransom trilogy that are Tortured just planet. garish, yeah. but but they're delightful to hold in your hand. Yeah. What about you, Steve? What's a favorite find? I think probably one that I, I enjoyed acquiring the most was I'd heard uh, about an auction in London while uh, my family and I were staying in London. And alleged to have uh, a copy of Spirits in Bondage. And I'd never, I'd never even seen a copy, a first edition copy of Spirits in Bondage. And um, what was particularly exciting to me about this particular copy, it was signed by C.S. Lewis. Wow. He says, with thanks from the author, as if to let the person know uh, it's not Clive Hamilton, but it's me, C.S. Lewis, who wrote oh, this boy. Uh, and I'd never been to a book auction before. So it was just exciting to spend an afternoon in London. Um, and there was just this one Lewis book. There were lots of posters and some other odd things uh, in the sale, but we waited and we waited. And finally the book came up. And, uh, and again, talking about heart beating and excitement. And there were a couple of bidders in the room, a couple of those online. Uh, but I was able to to acquire it at, at I think a, a reasonable price. But that's probably just the the active involvement of, of interacting with the book, and uh, and it's uh, some of the most valuable books that I have. I do keep in a safety deposit box because I figure that that eventually I will turn those over to a collection, uh, another place that uh, that I'm not. I don't really own them right now. I'm just the steward of those books. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping to uh, turn my entire collection uh, someplace. I have it as long as I'm still using them and in my talks and presentations, uh, I'm still enjoying them very, very much. But that particular book, a signed copy of ah. Spirits of Bondage, is a favorite, especially given the situation in which I acquired it. That was oh, great. Absolutely. As I think about it, some of my very favorite books are ones that have been given to me. I came and spoke for you at Texas State once and uh, can remember the day uh, precisely. And afterwards, you presented me with my first British first edition of Till We Have Faces. Um, and that was an incredible treat. Uh, Phil Keggy, with whom I traveled, every time I go visit him, I bring him a first edition Lewis of this or that to thank him for his legacy in my life. And uh, he, at one point, um, pulled a book off his shelf that I had coveted for many years and signed it to me. And it's a British first of The Great Divorce, but it was also signed by Lewis, my only signed copy. And that was a, that was a treasure. Um, I think recently, my, my favorite find, um, I had heard because of Gordon's site about the paperback of Till We Have Faces, but I just found one. Um, and was able to to bid on that on eBay. Um, and then I just got a first edition of uh, the Oxford History of English Literature. I don't know, Steve, if you know this. Have you seen this? Here's the Griffin. I have not. Okay. It's a, a, a little periodical or something called the Griffin. It's published by the Reader Subscription, Inc., and it's from March of 1956. And there's an article called Stimulating Scholarship, and it's a several-page review by W. H. Auden of the Oxford History of English Literature. Oh. We know that Auden was a friend of Lewis's and uh, a student of Tolkien's. And then there's even um, at the back of a little advert, 
a uh, little quote by Auden. So I may have to scan that in or um, and send it to you. So sometimes flipping through pages, you can find uh, find some things. Uh, what about one that got away? Uh, I already mentioned my letters to Charles or the, the the essays presented to Charles Williams for seventy five bucks that has escaped me. What about one that got away? Well, like as I said, being a, a lower kind of a lower end collector, my mm -hmm. sorrows are probably not as great as uh, those kind of working in the high end of the spectrum. Uh, but I do recall it was actually really before I, I was, before I was collecting Lewis. Um, and I was at a library that was just getting rid of a bunch of books. And I, there was a hard copy of this book. I didn't hardly recognize it called Rehabilitations. <gasps> it was really in night. It was a hard, you know, hardback. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that that's interesting. And, you know, a buck. And I put it back and walked out of the library because uh, this was before I didn't, I didn't even know what it was. And uh, yeah. Oh, well. Wow. How about you, Steve? One that got away? There have been a couple of uh, auctions of Lewis letters, mm -hmm. and I'm also, in addition to books, I'm interested in, especially I find myself interested in things that will be of value to researchers or, or scholars, mm -hmm. and so some of his unpublished letters. And there are a couple of those that, that I've wanted that have gotten away. And again, my motivation is, is not to acquire them just to, for myself, but uh, eventually so they can be like, like you, Andrew, to share them with, with a place where others can see them. Uh, at the, again, at the moment, I'm enjoying them and I'm using them and they're helpful to me in my own writing and research. It's helpful as I do my own writing to be able to pluck off the shelf a uh, first edition to know a page number from a first edition and, and to compare that. So uh, I'm still using my books, but there have been a couple of letters that I wished I could have acquired that, that I didn't. Hmm. But um, but I, I uh, there are still lots of things available. So it's it's not like, oh my gosh, that's, uh, uh, I, I hope and pray someone else will find that and put it to good use. Yeah, no, marvelous. And it is a market that uh, the prices I think have gone up fairly precipitously in the past couple of years, three or four years, but it's still a place where you can get in and get some, uh, get some good ones. Gosh, uh, yeah, you've heard about my ones that got away. Um, I think that if uh, if our Lord went to create a mansion for us in that mansion in our Father's house are many, many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you, I think that in my mansion there is a library, and in on the shelves of that library are the ones that got away. Um, I think the books, sometimes I'll you know, not be able to afford it, and then I'll go back and think, oh, man, I can make this work, and by the time I go, they're gone. But um, I think that maybe uh, that will be part of, uh, that was certainly be heaven to me to walk into a library like that. We talked a little bit about the importance of a nice edition for collecting, but, uh, and you touched on this, Steve, do you read your rarest editions? Do you read um, the different editions? Yeah, I do. I, I like to read them. Again, part of my interest uh, in, in having them is to collect them and again, to, for research purposes, I hope they're useful. And a first edition in and of itself, of, of the plain old vanilla first edition, first printing, for research purposes, those are available. But uh, but especially those that may have, uh, uh, again, we talk about things that, that I particularly enjoy, any book that Lewis owned mm -hmm. that have his comments. But yes, I, I, I do read them and I do use them. Probably my favorite comment, and uh, there's a book that used to belong to, to Lewis uh, about Neoplatonism. And in one place, he'd underlined it and just simply put in the margin with an exclamation point, fiddle dee dee. Um, <laughs> and I just find that sort of captures his humor and whimsy and observation. And of course, when he wrote that, he didn't think that, that some Texas college professor would read what he wrote in the margins of, of the books. If, we can, if you can imagine thinking someone might read what you write in the margins of your books, I'm sure Lewis thought that no one would ever read that little note. But it was something he wrote to himself, and again, it's it's uh, part of the joy of connecting with the author through through the book. Absolutely. What about you, Gordon? Do you read some of the some of the editions that you pick up along the way? I, I use them and refer to them mm -hmm. a lot because for comparative purposes. But I generally don't, uh, just because a lot of my first editions are pretty frail. 
mm-hmm. uh, because that's kind of the price point that I'm working at. So I have, I have, as, as Steve mentioned, sort of many, you know, first editions, seventh printing, things like that. And then some of them are in pretty rough shape. So if I'm going to actually sit down and, and read, I will pull, I will usually pull, you know, with the Harper Collins version. Sure. Um, uh, just because I can't afford to have them fall apart on me. <laughs> I wonder if you've had this experience. I have three levels of Lewis books. I've got my collectibles. Mm. I've got my reader's copies. Um, and I look for space in the margins and a nice roomy copy back end pages so I can make my own index. Uh, but then I also get giveaway um, Lewis books. So ones that I know that I don't want to pull off my own shelf. And then as you all saw and saw you grin, um, do you ever smell your first editions? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, it's like the mimeograph sheets in elementary school that they <laughs> pass around. Well, yeah. and the British mold is mm-hmm. different than the English uh, or than the American. I had a friend once who could pop open a book and go, Scotland, Wales, America, just by sniffing. Um, so I thought that was a unique, uh, a unique thing. And that was part of how Kristen and I courted these uh, huffing books at the <laughs> stores. Um, so... Well, good. What other topics? Anything else that you would uh, that you can impart to our to our listeners about this uh, this journey that we've been on? You know, I I just encourage those um, to to find a connection with their author through books. I once asked a, a bookseller, "Why do people collect books? What is it about? Do you find something in common with those who collect books?" And I remember him saying very clearly, "This was a bookseller in London," and he said, "Yes." because people have a particular connection with that author. Mm -hmm. There's something about that author. And so this is a a nonverbal expression of our affection for this author. We want to have, in some ways, I think about these are souvenirs of ideas. Mm -hmm. Just as we collect souvenirs from countries we visit to remind us, this is a, a first edition is a souvenir of these ideas that we want to get close to this. We, we draw toward things we like mm-hmm. in, in communication, a basic principle. So we draw toward Lewis books because we love them. And, and it's not the book itself. It's like we don't worship the literal Bible, and, and but it's the, the ideas from the Bible. So it's not that I worship Lewis or worship these books, uh, but I find it a, a, a metaphor in my own life of thank, being thankful for these ideas and using them in my own research and writing, and then um, someday sharing them with others. Oh, fantastic. What about you, Gordon? And then I have one final question before you wrap Or my, I guess my parting, my parting shot was, is, a, is a more prosaic uh, plea, a request, is I invite, uh, I invite Lewis collectors and readers to go to their shelves and sit down with those books and pull them off. It doesn't matter what, you know, how new or how uh, beat up the edition is. And, uh, you know, and then sit down at the, at the Disordered Image, the website, and compare and help us plug holes. Send us information. If you see something that's wrong or you say, hey, you don't have the date for this printing and here it is on my shelf, uh, become part of the community. Um, let's uh, crowdsource uh, this history that has to be literally put together from uh, many artifacts because it doesn't exist anywhere. Many of his, many of the publishers of Lewis books are out of business. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's we, the community of people who love Lewis and what Lewis wrote, who, uh, who need to reconstruct this history. And it's a thing that we get to do together. Mm. And I find that exciting to interact with people uh, who have this little bit of, just this little bit of knowledge sitting on their shelves. They didn't know they had that they can now share and be part of building the legacy. You know, it's the C.S. Lewis edition wiki that you're running and that... It begins to feel like it, yeah. yeah. But. Um, it, it, listeners, if you don't know, the Oxford English Dictionary um, grows by readers all over the world finding words that the OED doesn't have entries for and finding instances of its earliest occurrence and then sending them into the dictionary. And they marshaled, you know, they've marshaled thousands of people over centuries now to uh, to compile that and i think that um i appeal to you i join uh join the appeal to help out the disordered image go and look and compare them to books on your shelf and if you have something that gordon doesn't have please can it get in touch with him i don't know if it was more of a delight to track down editions of lewis books that i or of till we have faces books i didn't have or a delight to just zoom with gordon and show him some things that he didn't have i thought well of course he's got this so uh so uh, yeah that's uh, i think that's a great action point moving forward finally 
What's your dream find? If you could have one C.S. Lewis book that you don't have, what would that be? Well, I, I mean, I'll go first. I had a, I'm an audiobook narrator in my day job and had a, an opportunity to produce a, an independent version of Spirits in Bondage because no American Audible had not listed an American edition. And I kind of found my way into producing one. So I have a special love for Spirits in Bondage, having been able to voice as poetry is supposed to be sort of read out loud. I had a chance to do that. And so I would love to one day lay my hands on a first edition uh, or close to it. Um, it's a it's a dream I probably won't fulfill till I reach heaven, you know, and I go into that room with you. <laughs> um, but yes, that, that would be really, really cool for me. Let's visit each other's libraries. And there you go. What do you say? What about you, Steve? I enjoy uh, touching books that C.S. Lewis touched. Mm -hmm. I enjoy, uh, and again, an assigned uh, first edition in terms of its research value is, is relatively low unless there's any markings on it. So, but I still enjoy finding those because it's a connection with Lewis. But but uh, now I enjoy finding books that Lewis owned that carry his signature, that also reflect his thinking. The uh, Roman canon of invention of where do ideas come from? And so to get a peek into seeing Lewis read something and again, marginal notes or, uh, notes that he wrote at the end of the book. Uh, those are things of, that are of continual interest to me, probably more interest than just the, the uh, just a first edition, um, but books that Lewis interacted with, uh, where I can learn something about C.S. Lewis. That's, mm. that's my interest. Mm. Oh, that's fantastic. And I know that there's a maudlin English professor, uh, Professor Simon Horobin, who has been at the Oxford C.S. Lewis Society. You can find his talk just this last term. And I believe he'll be with us at Oxbridge next year. And I got to spend a few hours with him at Maudlin College. And he's interested in Lewis's annotations to literary works and doing scholarly research on that. I think for me... Um, well, listeners, you could you could band together. There's a there's a signed first edition of Till We Have Faces at Stan Shelley's shop for six thousand dollars, and I have <laughs> not been able to, to to offer him enough in trade. Uh, but if anybody's feeling particularly grateful for the wonderful benefits of this show, please feel free. I think that because that book is so important to me, or a first edition signed of of a uh, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe which in some ways started it all. And uh, I think I'm bidding on a, a first edition uh, sometime in the next couple of days and see if I get it. So those are, those are dream finds. So, well, thank you so much. What a delightful uh, hour to spend talking about my very favorite thing. Thanks for coming on the show. And uh, where can listeners go to find out more about you? And of course, we'll put in links that we've already mentioned, but tell us one more time. I have a, a website, uh, stephenabb.com, that uh, has information about my uh, book, C.S. Lewis and the Craft of Communication. Uh, and they can always, I'm happy to get an email from those who have questions at uh, sbb at txstate.edu. Hmm. And you've recently retired, is that correct? I have. I've I, I've finally figured out that I've semi-retired. Uh, <laughs> I still find that I'm I'm writing and researching and chasing after ideas, but I've retired from full-time teaching at Texas State. Uh, but I continue to uh, work with words uh, and enjoy that process. Fantastic. And Gordon, and remind us your website again. Uh, the well, the discarded. I'm sorry, the disordered image at C. S. Lewis. Dot CS Lewis editions dot com. Okay. The, yep. Great. And we'll have those links up. I just want to, um, to remind our readers that it's not just about the physical bodies of the books, but it's Lewis being a door and a doorway. And I think in some ways his books are a door, a doorway into, uh, such marvelous ideas. And I'm reminded of the last page of, uh, of, Voyage of the Don Treader, or I'm sorry, the last battle, where they were had just cracked open the first page of chapter one of the Great Adventure, and I think that books in some ways serve us. They've often been used in Christian circles as a metaphor for our own life, and I would encourage us as we delight in the bodies and and contents of books to remember that we too are books. 
being written by God? And what will that narrative say about us? And how will we capture his light and the intrigue of others? How will we, uh, through our lives, allow God to write in such a way that we, um, we let our light so shine before people that they see our good works and glorify God? So that's certainly our prayer. Well, in closing, I want to thank again my guests for coming on to the show. Thanks to all of you for listening, and especially to our Patreon supporters who make so much of this possible. And that's particular thanks to our top-tier supporters, including Shane and John, Kevin, Brian, Kay, Monique, Paul, Kimberly, Gillis, Gary, Jake, Stephen, and Matt, Jeff, Kelly, Chris, John, James, Kate, And Rowdy, we raise a glass and say cheers to you. You can always find more about us at uh, about this podcast at pintswithjack.com. You can easily find us on social media, audible.com, just about everywhere you can go. You can find all of our past episodes. You can send us messages if you have anything you'd like to uh, like to save. You can pick up a laser etched pints with Jack glasses. We're always looking for new Patreon supporters and want to welcome you into our Slack channel. Uh, We call that pints with Slack. uh, So a great community. Listeners, please join us next time. When we'll be going further up and further in. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.